Good afternoon, Vijaya, and hello, and welcome to everyone watching. Hi, Christine. Good afternoon. Yes, Vijaya, I'm so excited to be chatting with you today. Um, you know, I run a podcast, and I just love talking with other engineering leaders about the challenges we face today. So I'm so happy that we can actually share this live with a bu bunch of other engineering leaders as well. Uh, the topic of the conversation today is going to be on scaling teams and culture, and this is something that you have a tremendous amount of experience with. So uh, with that, let's get started, okay? Absolutely. I'm very excited, um, and thanks for having me here. Awesome. Uh, I think the first thing is, since we're talking about scaling, um, people always talk about scaling teams, platform, culture, et cetera. Uh, but when we talk about scaling, what does scaling really mean to you, Vijay? Yeah, so scaling, you know, simply put, it's about creating multiplier effects, right? And the point of creating these multiplier effects is that if you put marginal effort or incremental effort and in, and in some way cost or effort, whatever it is, you're able to gain a big outcomes, big step changes in outcomes and results. Ultimately, that's what we're hoping for, right? How can we do very little and gain a lot? That's all scale is about. Excellent, yes. So I think, and related to this, you know, you've helped lots of teams and companies grow rapidly in the past. And from that, you've, uh, I think, formed a framework for helping teams to scale and transition to that. Um, let's talk about that. And I think you also, there's a graphic that you might have put together uh, to help guide people through that. Absolutely. Yeah, so as I uh, worked in different organizations and thought about scale um, a lot, you know, there are so many things you need to do right. And sometimes it can get really overwhelming in terms of uh, what actually needs to happen. So uh, I kind of formed this uh, graphic or this pyramid of scale, as I call it, in my head. Uh, to help me guide through some of these uh, challenges that we encounter. Um, so simply put, this, this pyramid has three layers, and uh, each layer is focused on a specific aspect of scale. Starting with the bottom layer, which is uh, foundational uh, capabilities, this is anything you know, from a technology product. You know, think of this as automation. Think of this as putting in place a great uh, CI/CD uh, uh, platform and framework, or investing in methodologies like Agile or DevOps. These are the types of things at the foundational capabilities layer. Once you put in place, you can get a lot of leverage out of that, and it becomes much more easier to do things in the future. And the middle layer is about scaling teams. Uh, this is all about, you know, no organization has infinite resources, no matter how large, and we always have more to do than the resources, right? So how do you kind of uh, set up your team and structure um, in terms of processes and other things so that, again, you, you are able to get more out of the, your team? And in this context, scale is not about increasing the size of the tree team or growing the size of the team. Sometimes it is, but not always. Uh, it's more about how do you get more out of uh, the existing teams and making it much more easy to operate. Sure. And then final piece at the top of the pyramid, um, uh, clearly, is the culture, right? So you can have the best teams and best tools, but if you don't have the culture and the teams are not aligned and growing in the same direction, you know, nothing happens. So that's a simple framework um, uh, in, in which I think about uh, scale. Awesome. Yeah, and I think that's a great framework to put together. And I'd like to go into some of those uh, those levels of the pyramid a little more detail in this conversation. Uh, and maybe we can start at the bottom, sort of that, that appropriately named foundation level. Um, and one of the things you talked about was embracing change um, and how important that is. So when you talk about that and as a core foundation level, why is embracing change so important to scale uh, companies, especially as a leader? Yeah, so you know, we live in a world, uh, Christian, as you know uh, very well, everything is so uh, rapidly evolving and changing all yeah. around us. And uh, you know, we are in the middle of innovation, and things suddenly seem to hit us in all directions, right? So um, embracing change is all about you know, if there are newer emerging technologies or processes or frameworks or whatever it is that are coming at you, you may not be able to stay current every single time and drop everything else and kind of you know go to the newest shining shiny object, but uh, but at the same time we have to strive really uh, deliberately to stay current and stay uh, in lockstep, you know no more than one generation behind. Otherwise, what happens is 
all of a sudden, let's say you, you are still on waterfall and haven't even evolved to agile, and, and from there, you know, how could you even get into iterative development or DevOps or you know, every other change after that becomes so hard because all of these things stack up on each other. Sure. So the principle here is, you know, stay current, no, you know, no more than uh, one generation behind, if at all possible, as a as a core base time principle. Great. And now the one thing that naturally people ask then, especially with the rapidly increasing pace of change, yeah. how do, as a leader, how do you stay up to date? Like, how do you, what do you do? Any tips you have to make sure you know what's the latest thing now or coming in the future? Yeah, staying a lot of uh, a lot of times it's about you know kind of reading and talking to other leaders like yourself and you know staying connected to the communities. Um, I, I do participate in a lot of public Slack channels and get connected with a lot of colleagues from different uh, industries and different companies in the industry. Um, attend regularly conferences like this. Get to know from each other. You know, books, magazines, blogs, podcasts. <laughs> you know, all of the above. And. Something too, I think not everybody is on board with change, right? And so it's not just about you know staying up to date, but it's also about convincing some of your other teams and your leaders that change is important. How do you help guide other leaders to convince them that change is also important? Yeah, so this is a you know, change management. Obviously, is one of the hardest things uh, we all have to do as leaders. You know, knowing the right answer is not enough, right? You know, how do you? How do you bring the teams along, whether it is uh, you know teams below you or peers or, or executive team that is above you? Um, that's uh, you know that's where we you know at, at some point it almost feels like maybe I'm spending all my time doing that <laughs> more than anything because it's so hugely important for everything else we do. Um, you know, the the best thing I found is. Um, not coming across as you know this is a final change and this is what we're going to be implementing, but you know slowly and steadily kind of uh, bringing the idea, gathering input at all levels, and including all levels uh, of people as we build the idea, and almost kind of make it a collaborative effort and make it a team's idea or, or a group's idea. That you know what is what I seem to work best. Uh, definitely at Airbnb and other companies that I've seen. Sure. No, excellent. Those are, those are great points. And I want to jump to another one you talk about, which is automation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we always talk about scaling systems and you want them to, you know, grow, you know, sublinear or absolutely not like quadratic. But what are some of the more important things to help automated companies at scale, like from a process or thinking? If you come in and go to a company, what are some of the first things you look at to try to help scale that, that from an automation standpoint? Yeah, so automation, you know, again, as you said, it, it takes a lot of shapes and forms. There is a, definitely a, a technology level automation, whether it is you know, automating your test frameworks and unit tests and all of that type of thing, which is standard. But also, you know, today, as we are deploying more and more rapidly within cloud, automating the end-to-end -end deployment pipeline with CI, CD, bringing in, in tools like Spinnaker or others that will help you automate every step of the way so that you know the not only the deployment but you know uh, uh, rolling back changes if something goes wrong or doing canary analysis all of those types of things become very easy and simple to do but also um, you know shifting gears at a business level today so much happens with data and data is uh, such a core piece of everything that uh, all businesses are based upon so leveraging, you know, uh, machine learning uh, and, and the data that you have to automate as much as possible from a business decisions and, and the actual technology that you're building, that is another key aspect of that automation. I um, mean, we can also talk about process automation. It's not so much about automation as much as putting a great uh, framework and operating system in place so that teams can uh, much more easily make decisions uh, not not automated completely. Nobody can automate decisions, but giving enough framework so that it feels like the decisions are being made automatically and easily. Yeah, that's a good point. Again, I could dive into for half an hour on any of these points we talked about. <laughs> because yes. so but I do want to kind of make sure we can get through uh, the different points we have. And and if we move up the pyramid now to that to that middle layer, which you mentioned is scaling teams. Um, if you can just do a recap uh, really quickly, what were the three main points on the scaling team section? 
Yeah, we actually explicitly didn't talk about this up front, but you know, each of those layers further breaks down into three principles, if you will. At the middle layer of scaling teams, it's about first and foremost establishing a clear operating system, as I was talking about, yep. which is more about you know uh, when you scale organizations. Oftentimes, the confusion is around who 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 makes what kind of decisions. Where do we draw the line in terms of empowering and, and top down and bottoms up? All this type of uh, scenarios, right? So, really establishing uh, the why we are doing something. What what needs to happen, and then empowering the teams on the how. That's one of the key pillars and key, key principles there. The second thing I would say is um, focusing on core mission. Um, what I what I mean here is that you know in a technology organization, we often make have to make decisions about build versus buy, right? This is a classic problem. I'm sure uh, you have faced yourself multiple times. And then the tendency of the engineering teams and technology teams typically is like, you know, I have the resources, I have the brain power, let me go, you know, build it first, right? And, and I get, it's good for my career, it's good for me, so let me build it. But uh, the challenge is that if, if you start building every single thing, then we won't be able to scale, right? It's against the scaling principle. So um, the principle here is that, Focus on your core mission and evaluate every single decision from the lens of, is this really core to my mission? And if it is, then build it in-house. In, in but if it's not core to your mission, it's just a means to an end, it is a supporting technology, supporting tool, um, then it's almost always best to uh, buy, right? And the buy can come in many forms. It could be you know, buying off the shelf, leveraging open source, or sometimes outsourcing, right? Um, you know, like the, we, we can work with partners like Lohika uh, and others who have excellent talent uh, that you can work with. And once you build that kind of partnership, you can outsource parts of your stack that are not core to your mission and still focus on you know, your mission with your team and be more strategic about it. And the third principle there is a ruthless prioritization. You know, everything is about prioritization at the end of the day. Uh, as you know, uh, Christian, uh, we talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, the prioritization often is about strategy, and strategy is about what to do, and also equally what not to do. Um, so that all of that plugs into prioritization, um, and using these three principles, you can scale teams really well. Yeah, I don't want to get back to if if, I, if we were in the audience right now, I'd be asking the question. How many managers right now have had to stop teams from like building it themselves <laughs> and it already exists? Like everyone is out there, raise your hand. I know you can't see you, but uh, it's something that I, as an engine leader and most engineers leader I talk to, also run into that. Right, but I, we can do it better. It'll take a weekend. Why don't we focus on that? Right? But if it's not part of your core value proposition, you know, I think that's that's kind of really good as you talk about the focus uh, and how that helps. Um, but I do want to go into a, a, something you talked about here, too, because super important. When you talk about ruthlessly prioritizing, now, not just prioritizing, but what's the difference for you between like really, truly ruthlessly prioritizing versus just regular prioritizing? Yeah. Um, when I say ruthless prioritization, what I really mean is that being very disciplined and having the the, uh, the conviction to not do certain things, right? And you know, as we are prioritizing, clearly everything is stack ranked. And you know, let's say you you start from the top and start working on things, you have to have the discipline to draw a line somewhere and be comfortable that these items are falling below the line, and we are okay with it, right? That is the part that falls apart in a lot of cases because um, you know. The tendency is for everyone wanting to do everything, and when you do everything, you don't do anything really well. And so that's the that's the key. There is just being comfortable, being very explicit about this is what we want to focus on, and this is something we are okay not to prioritize for the time being, for the quarter, for whatever duration it is, and 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 really sticking with it. Um, and and part of this is also for this kind of ruthless prioritization to work correctly. I think the what we are prioritizing needs to be comprehensive as well. Uh, what I mean is that it's not just customer facing features or capabilities that you're prioritizing, but you have to take into account 
all of the technical debt, all of the maintenance work, all of the forward-looking innovation or any type of uh, capability like that. Because at the end of the day, all of those things take resources, right? So if you only prioritize customer facing and everything else is kind of like, you know, scrambling at, you know, to figure out how to get it done, that is not going to help. So putting all of those things through the same funnel and really going and having very strategic conversations about why we are doing this in this quarter and, uh, and why not, that is what I mean by ruthless prioritization. Yeah, that's a good point. And it's such an important thing. Even, you know, Cheryl Sandberg at, at Facebook gives a new manager orientation where, you know, she talks about driving that home where it's not about deciding between the good versus the bad. It's really about deciding which of the good things you're not going to do to focus exactly. on the great things, right? Right. Uh, and you made a really good point around putting everything through a funnel, that you can't prioritize half the work if you still have this other half of the work. But then, then you're not getting a good picture of all of the things, right? Is there, is there any other framework, any tips that you can help give to managers here to help provide them with a framework for prioritization? Yeah, so this is what I, I typically do. Uh, I've done in a couple of different uh, companies um, uh, where, you know, when I start um, as a new leader in an organization, usually getting a picture about what are the different uh, um, stakeholders, who are the different stakeholders and what are the different pillars that we need to attend, um, right? But it is like, you know, I said, you know, there is scope for maintenance, there is tech debt, there is customer facing, maybe there is a, you know, customer success team that is coming at you for certain things. Um, you know, there are many various sources that you need to take into account. So just kind of getting an understanding of all of those different sources and then really creating almost like a stack ranked list of, you know, one to whatever in, in a way and having that conversation and the discipline that is important too, like you know, it gets harder as you have hundreds and hundreds of items, obviously, but, uh, you know, figuring out uh, relative to each other, what actually is higher and lower, you know, you do that upfront a couple of times and you will feel you will get, build the muscle and it becomes easier over and uh, over a period of time and then in the long run actually it pays off huge dividends and that really worked for me uh, extremely well awesome thank you and yeah i'll say it again uh there's so much good information here so if anyone just, just takes one or two pieces of this back that's listening i think uh, it'll make a big uh, impact uh, on helping you to scale your companies uh, as we come now to the top of your pyramid uh, the scaling culture. Uh, so two things here. One, tell us a little more about the aspects that make up that top piece, but also I'm interested in why you put the culture one at the very top. Yeah, so that's like the icing on the cake, right? It has to be on the top because ultimately, you know, within the product process and people, that's another way to think about those three layers. People are at the top of everything we do unless we have people aligned and people being happy and, and motivated, nothing else matters. So that's why it's at the top, Number uh, first of all. And the three principles I would say under culture, again, our first is um, incentivizing ownership for people in terms of driving culture. We can talk about what that means in more detail. Um, second is focusing on, on customers. When I say focus, not just focus, but you know, really obsess about customers in, in many ways. In some cases, the customers could be external. In some cases, the customers could be internal. Either way, it's still um, a priority. And then last but not least, democratizing communication. Because one of the biggest hurdles as you scale the teams and scaling culture is how do you get alignment and communication uniform and smooth communication flow as well as consistent messaging across the organization is a super important aspect of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to talk about that last point for a moment. I think communication is always important, but now as we're all working distributed, it's even more critical. So right. what are some of the tips you have for, for some leaders today to help help with that communication flow uh, in, in every day, but especially when we're distributed? Yeah, so the couple challenges, right? One is, uh, you know, teams are distributed and first of all, everybody is Zoom fatigued and whatnot and it becomes harder to bring everybody into a, a large team meeting type of setting and, and cascade information. That is one way, but that is not sufficient because A, the people are not able to make all of the meetings and it's, it's also sometimes information overload. 
So what I'm trying to see is what's the best way to continue, continue to reiterate some of these messages through various channels. And you know, you have to hear, teams have to hear messages like three times, four times before it finally sinks in. And so what, what combination of channels can you use to create that type of uh, flow of uh, information in a smooth um, and consistent manner? So one thing that I do, for example, is you know, just uh, posting a thought of the day on a Slack channel with, with the entire team. And it, it doesn't need to be very long, but you know, a short paragraph or something, uh, but consistently posting something and you know, kind of drawing upon, let's say you hear a, a piece of feedback from someone and you know that, hey, this particular piece of information is not very clear to people, then just use that opportunity in real time to clarify that using that mechanism and it, it works uh, it works pretty well. Um, in addition to that, you know, the standard um, ways of town halls and all hands and all of that are always there. Um, the other the other thing I would say that worked really well for me um, is doing kind of a small round table meetings. You know, this is uh, not the entire team, but like groups of five to eight people. In a, in a room, I'm sure you know many leaders do this. The beauty of that is you know, people that don't open up in larger forums, uh, all of a sudden have a forum where they can have a dialogue directly, it leads to great discussions, and I love doing those things. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And you know, one thing that I get asked a lot too from different people is, you know, how do you know when you've achieved scale? Like, is there an end state there? Like, what do you tell people if they have to do that? Great question. Um, you know, there are many ways of uh, figuring that out. Some are quantitative, some are qualitative, right? From a quantitative perspective, ultimately, if you see, uh, why are you trying to achieve scale? When we first talked about this, it's about, you know, getting larger um, step changes in outcomes and results for smaller investment, right? So you have to be able to see larger ROI on the dollars that are investing. That's one way of quantifiably seeing it. And ultimately at a business level, the unit cost has to go down over a period of time. Because when you first start a business uh, or a company, you're investing in a lot of things and you know, obviously the cost is high at a unit level, but over a period of time, if you're doing this the right way, you know that unit cost has to come down. That's a quantifiable, but on a qualitative level, I think there are so many other things, right? You can you can see the decisions are made very quickly, teams are aligned and motivated. Uh, you don't need to be there on the ground every single day. You actually can afford to take a vacation for a week or two and things will, <laughs> things will work smoothly in your absence. So there are many other ways that you can figure out, like, yep, it feels like things are running like a well-operated, well-oiled machine and you know, we, we feel like we have accomplished scale here. Great, and and it keeps going, right? You, you can keep going yeah. up. And, and it, it's never a done deal, right? It's always, uh, there's something to be done and it's a continuous iteration, absolutely. Awesome, awesome. So I know we have a couple of minutes to do and I want to get to some of the questions um, that we have here uh, from the audience. So I do see one, let me, let me read this one off now. Uh, as as you scale, uh, what are some of the common barriers to achieving scale you've seen uh, in the past? And what are the things, and how have you overcome those barriers? Have you been able to get outside uh, resources to help with them, you know, internal the company, outside of the company? What are the tools you have, right, to help overcome those barriers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the barriers to scale, I would say, is that um, first thing is the alignment uh, across organization, we talked about this a couple of times. At yep. Alignment on strategy as well as alignment in terms of um, the principles of how we would actually accomplish something, right? Um, that's an important one. You know, uh, bringing the team along, um, uh, one of the tools is like, you know, uh, principles we talked about is establishing and incentivizing ownership. You know, when, when we focus on that ownership piece and if every individual feels like they're an owner of the company, not just an employee, um, um, that goes a long way in accomplishing this, right? And then in terms of actual tools there, you know, uh, not just monetary incentives, but rewards and recognition, you know, every, you know, aligning every thought, word, and action that you take, you know, uh, to reiterate that same message and, and uh, positive reinforcement of the message that this is how we reward people here and that goes a long way as well. 
And in terms of actual uh, other tools, like focusing on core mission, as we talked about leveraging partners and, and, and really being methodical about which one, which work items are things that will be done by your team, which ones are done by somebody else, and leveraging those resources effectively is another important tool. Uh, I mean, we can go up, uh, down the pyramid and talk about every one of those in more detail, but uh, I'll let you ask other questions. Interesting, because it, re it relates back to one of the earlier points we didn't talk about in your framework, which is about using data for decisions. Um, and someone is asking, what about diversity? Um, if AI is amplifying our blind spots uh, with some devastating implications, because decision makers are looking at the same set of backgrounds, don't recognize those gaps, and you're using data, you know, how do you how do you make sure that the data is being used for good and not amplifying sort of the status quo? Yeah, that, that is a very um, difficult problem and challenge, obviously, you know, all of us are dealing with and, uh, you know, keeping um, anti-discrimination, discriminatory uh, ways of, you know, looking at and reviewing your models and making sure you remove any bias from the models and constantly, uh, you know, paying attention and getting, you know, internal reviews, external reviews as much as possible to eliminate any kind of bias. I mean, these are some things we can try and do, but um, I, I agree, this is a complex problem. I wish there was a simple answer. Uh, but, you know, really, it starts with recognizing that this is a problem and doing everything you can. Uh, you know, studying, uh, is there actually bias introduced on your platform? And how can you mitigate some of that um, once you understand there is any discrimination or bias? Okay, great. Uh, we have another one from Sai, uh, I believe, here as well. Uh, and, you know, what framework do you use for prioritization at Airbnb? Is it durable or do you deploy different frameworks for specific products or contexts? Um, you know, answer as, you know, as much as you feel okay with sharing there. Yeah. Um, I'll also more generally to say that, you know, in larger companies, uh, anywhere that I've been, usually there is not a single framework that works for all teams and all organizations. It is pretty custom depending on the specific problem space and what works for the team, right? So it's very local. Um, like I said, you know, I, I've tried a couple of different frameworks. One is uh, what I call the uh, business prioritization list, which is like strict track ranking, including a comprehensive list of sources and, and uh, things. There are other ways of doing that in different models as well. Uh, but again, there's no one answer that fits everyone. Uh, it depends on the, the need specifically. But the principle is still the same, right? You are still trying to accomplish the same thing, no matter what the tool or the specifics. Okay, good. I think we have time for one more here. Uh, Angie uh, asks, in our productivity-oriented culture, in such fast-paced environments, how do you foster healthier work-life balance so we can attract and retain great talent? Yeah, so, you know, I think uh, um, this is why I keep talking about ruthless prioritization and focusing on core mission as a couple of my principles. Um, what happens if you don't follow those is exactly what you're talking about. People get burnt out and, you know, there is a tendency for wanting to do everything. And, uh, you know, pet projects sometimes cause a lot of fines, right? You know, again, uh, Christian, as you were saying, this only takes over the weekend. I can squeeze this in and there was your weekend. You don't want to end up in that situation. So leveraging these type of frameworks and really partnering with uh, leadership to First of all, communicate very openly if this is what is happening. Um, you know, it's a it's a very acceptable thing to talk about it, especially the today's environment when everyone is burnt out and they have hundred things they need to juggle. What's going on in the world versus families and work and lots of things. So feel free, and everyone should feel free to talk about it explicitly with the leadership, and and really uh, bring some um, you know get some help in where it is needed. Awesome. So we're kind of running out of time. I do want to thank Plato for organizing and Lohika for sponsoring this session. Uh, and Vijaya, super thankful for your time today. This was such an incredible session. And I know everybody watching is going to be able to take home some of these tips, apply them, and really help them on their journey to scale. So it was great to have a conversation with you. Love to deep dive with you on some of these things in more detail, actually offline too. Uh, but thank you very much. Thank you so much again, uh, Plato, uh, Lohika, thanks for the opportunity. Christian, you've been such a great host. I really enjoyed talking to you today, and uh, hopefully this was helpful to everyone. All right. Thank you. Take care.